Hello. <laughs> Uh, hello, I would like to uh, introduce this panel and Ms. Kelly McCain, who is the moderator of this panel from our partner World Economic Forum. Please, uh, Ms. McCain, uh, take the stage and introduce our panelists. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining this session today, uh, which is our first deep dive session on how we do it. My name is Kelly McCain, and I am head of health and healthcare initiatives at the World Economic Forum. And it is really our great pleasure not only to be here to celebrate the opening of the new four-hour center here in Serbia, but to hear from our global audience and hopefully inspire some action of how we can take this new work forward. So today, we'll spend the next hour or so deep diving with our panelists, hearing from their experiences, and of course, offering time for questions. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our panel. First, uh, Ms. Uh, Elena Vojevic, who is the director of C4I Serbia. Uh, second is uh, <laughs> Mr. Jo Joris Saizere, who is the acting manager and director of C4I Rwanda. Marcos de Souza, director of C4IR Brazil. <laughs> Dr. J.S., chief advisor of C4IR India. <laughs> and Dr. Yuta Cohen, who is the scientific director at MIDGAM, which is the Israel National Biobank for Research. So to set some very brief context, for those of you who aren't familiar with the C4AR network, it is a part of the World Economic Forum where we bring together experts from governments to help think about how we curate a global agenda in using emerging technologies and really help be that connector between businesses, academics, as well as governments in, uh, in different country level contexts. And from a global agenda, they are really valued partners to think about how not only we curate a set of work that we do in this context, thinking about how we solve some of the largest global health and healthcare challenges, but more importantly, really bring local learnings and help us elevate it to a global context. So as I mentioned, I, the, really the goal of today is to hear from these centers and better understand what the opportunities are to further health and healthcare and just really hear about what's going on in a global context. So to get us started, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to spend about two minutes sharing what their priorities are, what they're thinking, and um, how they're bringing emerging, emerging technologies into their health and healthcare systems. So I will start with, uh, with you, Elena, for about two minutes from your perspective. I have five? No. <laughs> okay. uh, just shortly, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. and. Uh, um, I'm really glad that I'm part of the network, that the center is part of the, of the global network of the World Economic Forum. And uh, as previous panelists on the, on the government panel said, that it is key that we connect ourselves and that we build the network and that we all work together on globally uh, boosting the, the biotechnology. This is something that the center will do. Um, Mr. Borge Brand also presented that uh, the center of Serbia is actually the one that is the only one that is dealing with the biotechnology. But uh, we also initiated um, the formation of a much broader alliance with other centers that are working in the area of health, but also in the areas of um, artificial intelligence, that we can group us ourselves together and then uh, share the knowledge and experiences as we cannot do it al alone. Uh, the Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution Survey was established in March of this year. Uh, our priorities are uh, biotechnology, bioinformatics, and the use of artificial intelligence in health in healthcare, and uh, some of our key projects that we just started is, I don't know, you probably heard our Prime Minister saying about the bio Four campus. Um, this is um, a platform that is being built, or, or the, the area that is being built as a new place for our scientists, our businesses, um, educational institutions that are all working in this sphere, in this area of uh, life sciences, where they will sit together, work <coughs> together, and uh, uh, make, uh, um, make a field for the, the, the advancement of biotechnology. The center will help the Biofor campus, but also other players, 
I, I know that, for example, in the Institute for Molecular Genetics in, in Serbia, uh, they're working on, on, um, um, uh, on, um, on pharmacogenomics, identifying which genes um, uh, are influencing the use of some uh, drugs. You know, there are some people that, that can react well on some drugs and some, and some don't. And for example, things that are done in the institutes, uh, our work will be related to helping them to transfer that to, um, to commercial uh, activity and help actually boost economy with the science that is being built here in, in Serbia. So this is the area and these are the examples of the things that we will do. Great, thanks. Now over to you, Joris, from a perspective from Rwanda. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Kelly. Uh, first of all, I just want to start by, by saying a big thank you to Yelena and her team for the invitation and uh, in general for, you know, brothers and sisters from Serbia. It's been, uh, uh, all of you have been very, very hospitable, so it's very nice to be here. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, in terms of what we're doing in Rwanda, and I think some of these were highlighted by um, Permanent Secretary of our Ministry of ICT Innovation in the plenary session. Uh, but we've started by establishing the foundation, basically what are the key pieces of uh, you know, frameworks, regulations, instruments we need to have in place for to unlock data, innovation, and, also, and so forth. So specifically speaking, there's a few things we're working on right now. Um, we're working to put in place a data sharing framework for healthcare data, uh, for both for primary and secondary purposes, so you know, clinical purposes as well as research purposes. What is that framework that allows uh, patients to exchange their data with doctors, doctors between doctors and so forth, um, working to put that in, to put, uh, to put that in place. Uh, B, we are <coughs> examining the current uh, licensing procedures for health tech solutions. Um, so right now it's not very clear who's supposed to be given um, a license for a health tech uh, company to operate. Um, you go to our equivalent of the FDA, they, take, they send you to the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Health sends you to the Data Protection Office, Data Protection Office sends you back to the Ministry of Health. So it's not a very, um, not a very streamlined process, so working to put in place uh, a more efficient uh, process that all startups can use. And this will be looking at um, software as a service type uh, products, but also software as medical device uh, type products. Um, with that, um, and the, you know, this might be a little bit unique for the Afri for the Rwandan healthcare system and some of the other African uh, countries, but uh, the public health system is by far the lion's share of um, healthcare activities. So, you know, 90% to 95% of all healthcare activities typically happening in the public health system. Um, so, for any startup to be able to, uh, let alone scale, for them to be able to test, they have to be able to get access to the health public healthcare system. Now, the current public procurement uh, procedures are not very friendly to um, to innovation, to early products. Um, so we're working to see how we can streamline the public procurement process, looking at artificial intelligence, for example, in healthcare, and, and seeing how we can have a mechanism through which startups can be able to sell uh, to government. And lastly, and very importantly, <coughs> um, putting in place ethical guidelines as well for the development of AI. Um, I should have said our focus at the center in, in Rwanda is AI and machine learning. Uh, applied to multiple different sectors, but um, we've also put in place ethical guidelines for the development of AI products and solutions. Now, um, all these things are, are amazing, they're great, we need to have them, but they're useless if you can't demonstrate um, the impact that these solutions are supposed to, to drive. And I, I look at my colleague here, Marcus, because we've been having a lot of these conversations, I'm curious to hear what you say about this, but, um, you know, <clears throat> there's one thing saying, so for example, a typical conversation will go like, we go to the Ministry of Health, like, hey, we have this startup here that has an amazing AI tool, um, and the Ministry of Health will be like, okay, sounds amazing, but you need to show us how that works, you know, what's the value, but then we're like, okay, we need your data to be able to show you that the value, so you're just going around and around in circles. So what we're trying to do is, trying to figure out ways we can start to demonstrate actual value on the ground. Um, and there's a couple ways that we're thinking about that. One is, um, usually if you have, you know, a, startup or company come in with significant investment. So there was an example that was given earlier about Zipline, which is this drone company that's delivering blood and medical products to remote areas of Rwanda. This was a um, um, nicely funded uh, company from the US. Typically, if you're having that kind of conversation, it's uh, a little bit more smoother to, to get, to get the, the right uh, support that you need. Um, but if, it's a, you know, if, if that's not the case, you need to be a little bit more creative. So what we're trying to do is, identify specific 
um, solutions, applications of AI that might not be necessarily too difficult to implement and have shown some value somewhere else that we can point to and say, hey, this has happened here um, and we can probably do the same thing here in Rwanda. So an example here is we're doing an innovation challenge uh, for digital screening for cardiovascular disease in, in Kigali and Rwanda in general um, and taking basically a solution that has worked somewhere and try to implement here, implement here in Rwanda that seem to, seems to work. So try to identify basically some real practical use cases of AI and these emerging technologies that we can uh, drive. So putting in place foundational policy instruments, but also working towards actually showing innovation uh, on the ground is what we're trying to do in Rwanda. Thanks for that. Um, Marcos, over to you for a perspective from Brazil. Okay, uh, well, in, first of all, I'd like to welcome Serbia, C4AR Serbia, for joining our network of 16 countries. <laughs> Welcome, we, uh, Elena. You are among uh, your partners now, and we take care of each other. We exchange <laughs> a lot of things together in this network. So welcome. You have uh, great opportunities for, for biotech and health industry in C4IR network. Well, uh, about Brazil, we, we have our center for, we've been uh, doing our center for two years. Until now, we have three priorities in Brazil uh, as inter artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and data policy. And these three large areas, we have projects in health, in manufacturing, in energy, and agriculture sector. And specifically for the health sector industry in Brazil, we have two uh, projects that we are developing. Uh, the first one was related to AI public procurement because it's a challenge not only in Brazil but in every country. How do governments procure AI solutions? It's completely different buying ICT technologies on the shelf and you have to be ready and you have a lot of details and complexity that you have to deal with. So we are developing this uh, AI a public procurement toolkit that's already available in the network of C4IR for other countries. <coughs> and we tested this framework in the large hospital in Latin America. Uh, the Hospital das Clinicas in Sao Paulo is the largest and the best medical school uh, in the Latin America. And we tested this framework in order to prepare the institution in order to procure AI. And to procure AI is only the top of the iceberg. They had to restructure the organization completely in order to make possible to acquire and develop AI solutions. They have to integrate and deal with 60 different systems in the hospital. And making it, they did a, a data lake in order to explore this data and all the framework that we developed in the C4IR network was applied and tested in this large hospital. The second project is related to data policy. The new uh, re uh, legislation in Brazil dedicated to data privates is recent. We have three, four years of existence. And what we soon realize is that the law is only the first step, the law related to data. Privacy. The second step is how could you prepare companies, universities, R&D centers, and most important, how we could prepare the government mm -hmm. to be responsible with this new law. And so we are developing a data governance framework to orient and teach the organizations about how to deal with the data. And we are testing this in uh, Secretary of Health in a, in a capital of a northeastern state in Brazil. We first developed this in Sao Paulo city, that's the largest city in Brazil. And we tested in another city in the northeast, that's the, one of the poorest areas in Brazil, in order to test in different realities how this organization, the health sector, deals with the data. And it's important because we were specifically for non-communicable disease, like diabetes, blood pressure, and so on. So we are in the process to developing this new data governance framework. 
And the idea is, after the, the institutions and the organizations are prepared to manage the data, how could we open this data for the society? How we could open the data that, that are in the municipalities, that are in the state, that are in the Ministry of Health, in order to provide an open data marketplace to foster new initiatives in the public sector, in the R&D sector, and in the private sector. How we could make this data, public or private, available to create new business opportunities and better uh, public services in Brazil. So these are what we're doing there in the health Did sector. Did you solve this problem? Huh? Did you solve this problem? Uh, we are testing. <laughs> that's, that's why we are a think tank and a do tank, because we develop the framework, we test, so we soon realize that's completely wrong. So we test it again, and this process will go. But I think it, the, the good point is that we have the network. So just to give an example, we didn't start from the scratch the public procurement mm -hmm. project. We used a project that was developed by World Economic Forum in UK, and we took this and take to Brazil. Of course, we had to adapt to Brazilian reality, but because of this, we saved like nine months uh, of learning, and so we advanced in a higher point to make it faster. So I think it's the beauty of the network that we are engaged. Uh, JS, over to you from India. Yeah, first of all, let me compliment Elena and the entire team for the launch of the new center in uh, Serbia. So wish you all the best going forward. And one key lesson we have learned in India where the C4IR India is four years old and which I would like to pass on to you is, you know, it's a very interesting and exciting kind of position to be in because you're required to think global but act local. You are in a country setting, you are in a regional setting, but you know, the global programs and ideas are extremely important. How do you harmonize these two is a, a challenge before us. So in the health, uh, in India, you know, see for IR India, we are into healthcare, agriculture, smart cities, and education as the national priorities. And within health, if you look at, you know, as see for IR India, we made a survey and then we found that there are three types of challenges in the healthcare sector, which is pretty much the same in most countries, which is the challenges of the healthcare sector per se, the sector problems like you know shortage of infrastructure, shortage of doctors and nurses and field people, and the infrastructure. So, like for instance, I, I'm quoting from India's example where, as against the WHO norms of 100 doctors per 100,000, we have 65. And as against 250, we have 130. And as against 350 beds, we have 130. So, so it's much below the norm that's recommended globally. So <clears throat> what is the challenges like this in the health sector itself? Second is the challenges caused by the external uh, environment, like you know the poverty, which is really not directly related to the health sector. You know, it's dealt by with the Ministry of, uh, you know, livelihoods and so on. So, but the poverty brings a lot of diseases, you know, like malnutrition and a host of other uh, ailments related to malnutrition. Third is challenges related to tech governance. I think Marcos was mentioning it as well as Joris. Also, the need for governing, especially the governing the data, uh, and other aspects related. How do you manage the data? How do you exchange the data? So after surveying these three types of challenges, the net-net conclusion one comes to from a C4IR perspective is, how do you do more with less? The less infrastructure, the less human resources, and the less wealth in the country uh, you know, and the affordability of the people, these are all shortages, you know. How do you create a situation where you're doing more with less using the advanced technologies or emerging technologies? Mm -hmm. That's the backdrop against which we have uh, 
uh, you know, created our strategy for the healthcare. You know, it, we identified initially 18 themes which are, you know, required to be, if we make a difference in those 18 themes within the health sector, then we have a better health for all in the country. So within those 18, we prioritize cancer as a first use case and first subsector that we are dealing with. So we have a project called First Cancer Care, which is at a stage of implementation in one of the states. So the question is, you know, thinking versus doing. So while the frameworks, etc., are purely an out, uh, outcome of thought process, but you need to test it out on the ground, you know, and fine tune the frameworks that we develop uh, as to how impactful they are on the ground. So <clears throat> while doing the frameworks, we also test it out in significantly large pilots in the state. For instance, the cancer project we have taken up in a, in a state which has the largest instance of cancer in the country, in India. So that's how it is. Likewise, in agriculture and other areas also. So that's where I would say that, uh, I would conclude by saying that, you know, you after uh, analyzing the country landscape, you try to create a strategy for the C4IR center in a way that harmonizes the, the frameworks and the impact required on the ground. Thank you. And uh, Judith, over to you to understand from Israel's perspective. Uh, I will do my best. <laughs> well, Israel is part of, uh, of this network of C4 IR, but I'm not part of that. <laughs> Uh, I'm a representative of the Israel National Biobank, and thank you for inviting me to this session. Um, from my perspective, um, having an infrastructure such as a platform, such as a biobank, is something that enables all the stakeholders you're talking about, industries, academia, all types of researchers within hospitals, outside of hospitals, government, um, patients uh, in the health healthcare system to, to gain something out of the options that a biobank can offer. So Israel started its national biobank eight years ago, but separate biobanks were already existed in several hospitals. So Midgam, which is in Hebrew samples, but the initials means Israel National Biobank for Research, um, is something that, it, it's a um, um, dispersed uh, um, um, entity which composes of, an, uh, at the moment, five hospitals, uh, some of the biggest in, his, in Israel. So we collect samples and we process them for further use, for future use of whoever wants to make use of that with a vision of promoting research to, uh, to help patients to get better healthcare. So we are focused on cancer, and I relate to mm -hmm. actually whatever uh, you have said. And I think we, we managed to build something that composed of mainly collaboration of industry, academia, government, and hospitals. So I'm sitting in the management uh, headquarters, and we are governing the different hospitals, and we are in touch with all different kinds of uh, researchers. And funding, which is, I think, the most important thing so the wheel can move, is coming from the government. Not only realizing that it is important to have such uh, a platform, but actually giving some money. It's not sustainable, they don't give enough money that we can you know, lay on our back and say, okay, we have enough. But the thinking was to be very multidisciplinary. So we have the Ministry of Economics with the Innovation Authority is part of the uh, funding um, um, entities. We have the, gov uh, the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology uh, funding some of the, of the um, project, and we have money coming from um, the Ministry of uh, Social Equality, uh, and 
I forgot something. We don't have money from the Ministry of Health, but we are under their supervision. So this is kind of, you know. And we also have money from the Committee uh, of uh, Academia, of high, high, uh, high uh, education. So I think the core thing is that we are doing things together with collaboration. So the priority is uh, bringing better health to the uh, Israeli citizens. And we're working in collaborations with other uh, entities and researchers around the world as well. Thanks for that. And I think a couple of the takeaways that at least I heard were, regardless of what advanced technology is being deployed, the important pieces are thinking about ecosystems and ecosystems that leads to impact. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to start off uh, some more questions mm -hmm. with, uh, with our host in Serbia today. Knowing these things and hearing from other colleagues, can you share just a little bit about how you're building out the ecosystem here and, and how you're thinking about driving impact in Serbia? Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank Judith, because I think uh, all of you, primarily for uh, being such a uh, lovely group and uh, letting me uh, joining joining the 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 centers the networks of the, the network of the centers but Judith in particular because one of the projects that we just started in Serbia is the uh, genomic repository uh, of Serbia and um, the network that we are trying to build around this is starting with um, uh, international successful practices and we have been looking at um, UK biobank also Israeli bio biobank and Judith was actually uh, excellent in helping us understanding where the funding can come from, what are the data needed to be within the uh, genomic uh, repository in Serbia, how we approach it, what are the, the key steps in order to make it. So on one level, we are making these connections between set centers, but also in particular topics, such as genomic repository that we are building. We will use the examples of different, uh, not only centers, but different, different countries that are already advancing there. So this is one ecosystem that we are building, because we keep talking about local ecosystems, but uh, we truly believe that the international ecosystem is also the key for advancement uh, uh, in Serbia. Uh, secondly, um, the, what I didn't say in my first answer is what exactly are we working on? Uh, not about the project, but how we are approaching it. So there are three things that we are doing. Uh, one is uh, pure connection and uh, mod uh, helping people meet, understand, and share what they know. Sometimes it's the key thing to success. Just being exposed to someone who knows and to someone that needs something. So this is, this is the key thing. It seems simple, but it's actually the most important and, and the key thing that we can do is helping uh, innovators, helping researchers to make connections with the government, make connections with the businesses, and help them um, um, transfer the technology to, to business sector. So this is, this is one, so making these dots and connections. Second thing that we do, we will work on policies, as colleagues said, and this is why I asked uh, um, uh, Marcos to, to share, aha, you did something about data and how did you do it and uh, do you, so this is uh, the second thing that we will work on, it's uh, the legislation that will uh, first of all introduce the Genomic Bank of Serbia, this is uh, one, but also we will work on um, um, uh, po policy that will help us use the data, anonymized data, pseudonymized data, use the health data, but not only the health data and genomic data, but other data that can help us actually build different uh, AI solutions. So because we, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about piles of data and information, and then we need to reuse it and, and find some uh, conclusions based on this data. And this is uh, what uh, the AI is serving for and helping us. So the second, the second portion of our activities are these policies that we are going to uh, create in all of these areas that, that I said. And the third thing that we are doing is the infrastructure. Because what we found, especially in the project that we are working on right now, the genomic repository, we found that there are um, needs, uh, sp especially in the research community, but also in the business community, uh, for the data storage, for, the, for, for having, um, um, we have a data center in Kragovac that I think some, some of the people will go tomorrow to, uh, to see how, how it, it functions, but uh, there are terabytes of data when you're working on genomics. So this is important, where to, where to host it, how, how to approach it, where to reuse it. So in addition to these pure data platforms where we will store the data, we're also building the IT platform for collaboration. 
So this is the IT platform, the software for collaboration of the researchers. So this is the, the second and the, and the industry. And um, we are also looking at, we have this supercomputer and uh, you know, access for businesses and uh, research uh, organizations to access the, the supercomputer and uh, this uh, technology that can help them actually uh, do uh, faster research. Because for some, if you have, of course, um, uh, the regular and standard uh, computers, sometimes it needs five days to process the data. In, in When we offer this solution to, to the, the supercomputers, they can do it in 10 seconds. So this is the big difference. Uh, and uh, it, helps, um, it helps our business sector and also the researchers act faster. And everybody was talking how we can move policies, but technology is moving faster. <laughs> it's actually, we, we want to, to accommodate all of these and move faster together. So this is, a, this is the third thing that we are doing. Thanks. And I think the technology moving faster than policy <laughs> is a huge challenge that we're seeing globally. So I would ask uh, Joris to share just some high-level thinking about how you oriented your ecosystem in your AI for procurement work and really have been starting to drive impact where other governments are looking globally to learn from what you did. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I mean, I, so it's still a learning journey, of course, and it's still a lot we need to accomplish. But I think um, one thing that we've quickly realized, and I was talked a little bit about this earlier, was how do we demonstrate value? Because I think um, there's an assumption that at least I had when I was starting out that you know everybody should understand that you know AI machine learning is important. We have to be talking about it, but that, that's not the case. So you know how do we? I think the biggest challenge that we have, at least in Rwanda as a center, is how do we make sure that all the different st involved stakeholders truly understand what AI means practically? How is that going to drive value for them? And so we've done an exercise of you know a macro exercise of identifying from you know just beyond health. Where could AI drive economic, tangible economic and social impact for Rwanda to understand where should we start in terms of like digging deep? Um, and so the next step there that we're also doing is then going to these different stakeholders and working with them to properly, clearly define specific problem statement, specific solution space that we can then work together to, to potentially drive some, some uh, uh, practical solutions or use cases of AI on the ground. And so um, I'll just stop giving it, I'll give the example of, of a digital screening innovation challenge for cardiovascular disease that we're running um, in Rwanda right now in partnership with uh, uh, Novartis Foundation, some of the partners on the ground. Um, and literally what that meant was we went to the Ministry of Health, we say, hey, what are some of your biggest priorities? What are some of your biggest challenges? Of course, non-communicable diseases is uh, increasingly um, important health burden for not just Rwanda, but for many health systems, um, quickly realize that that's one area where they are looking for scalable, affordable solutions um, that they can explore in terms of uh, uh, you know, addressing those challenges, work with them to, uh, essentially we did a user-centered design series of workshops where we define the problem space, define some potential solution that we can look at, um, and that has seemed to be, to be quite effective. So I think um, you know, the, the underlying point there is, um, not just assuming that uh, just because these technologies are cool, just because maybe we understand the value that, that they're going to drive, uh, that's not always going to be the case um, uh, for, for our different other stakeholders. So really making sure that we drive um, or show that value, I think, has been the, the biggest learning that we've seen and something that we're tr continuously trying to uh, do more of. Thank you. And Marco, so building on the defining value, you mentioned in your opening remarks that you have been in the process of testing frameworks and uh, bringing them back in for more work. How are you working with your ecosystems to define value and impact? And how are you as a center working to make sure that uh, the impact is, uh, is moving forward? Okay, uh, I think the first step that we had to deal with the ecosystem in Brazil was how we could communicate what C4AR does. It's not easy. It's something really new when you put together think tank and do tank concept. Mm -hmm. So uh, some people thought that we were developing technologies. Mm -hmm. No, no, yeah. we are not developing technologies here. Other people thought that we were um, like uh, think tank. So a lot of academia come, and, oh, let's write a paper together. No, no, we don't do that. And so it was difficult to explain for the government for the business sector, for the academia, and for the average citizen, what we are doing. 
because everybody here in the room knows what, or at least has some notion about AI, IoT, genomics, and so on, these emerging technologies. But the average citizen, and mostly of the business, government, and uh, community, they don't know what it is. So how do we communicate what we do for the average citizen? How we translate this conversation here about data, about AI, to change in the real life? So it's difficult to communicate. So this was the first challenge. And it depends on the level of maturity of each country. Sometimes it's easier for developed countries to deal with this concept. But for Brazil, I think for Rwanda, because we talk a lot, India, and probably Serbia, the maturity level is not so high. So we have to adapt this conversation about the message. The second challenge was, how do we choose the right projects? Because there is a tsunami of projects that come with ideas. Oh, you have to do that, do this, that, and so on. How do we choose? How do we measure the results of this project? How do you filter these projects to not confuse what is a problem of the country that could be solved easily by some other institutions or organization with complex problems that we deal with. That's our job, to deal with complex problems. So how to choose the right project? And the third problem that we faced was how do we, how do we design the project to be scalable? Uh, I use a joke that a lot of people would like to have a really beautiful project, a small project that's perfect, I call bonsai project, because like little tree in the Japan, that everybody sees it, oh, it's so good, this project, it's beautiful, and so on, but it never grows. It's beautiful, but never grows, never turned into a forest, never. We want to see forests. So to see forests, you have to think the business model, the process, the skills, since the day one. So if we do that, how do we scale this for thousands of companies, for hundreds of municipalities, for millions of people. So it, it brings a higher complexity for the project. And when you think about that, you start to define KPIs. You have to measure what we are doing. You have to know that the white paper is the first step, is not the final product. The report is not the final product. This is only the beginning. You have to take that knowledge and make it real. And it's difficult. That's why we, since the day one, we use real projects with different complex and maturity levels. Because if you choose to deal with only rich cities or big companies, it's an option. But if, if you want to deal with rich and poor, developed and undeveloped communities and regions, you have to think this is the day one. And it's not easy. It's complex. That's wh what we learn, because we have to make the change happen in the real world. And the reports and the frameworks and so on, it's only the first step. Thanks. And JS, too, I think with the success and the of moving from a framework into actual implementation stage with your first cancer work, what advice would you have to other centers and other governments in thinking about how you get to that implementation stage, and what's your role as a center in monitoring it? Yeah. I think you mentioned uh, one word before, which is the ecosystem. So that's uh, the base of currently, I think, uh, I have been at it, uh, IT for almost 30 years. Now we see a tr silent transition happening from IT to ET, meaning information technology to ecosystem technologies. We no longer think of designing systems, but we need to design for ecosystems at the national level at least, or sub-national level. So ecosystem is the key word that uh, even in the health sector, I was fortunate to be the national chair of an expert committee that was asked to design the 
blueprint for national digital health ecosystem, so which we did in 2018 and it's already advanced stage of implementation in India. So in the ecosystem, the goal is, you know, basic simple goal is the universal health coverage. How do you achieve that? What are all the building blocks that are required? So in the blueprint, uh, it is uh, brought out very clearly so that we are, we are aware that somewhere down the line we, we have the ecosystem uh, in place. At the heart of that is a federated architecture with certain core building blocks which are already put in place, like how do you identify people, how do you identify institutions, what are the standards for the health records, uh, do we take the universally accepted FHIR as a standard, how do you scale it down to the country's specific requirements and so on. Then another interesting thing we have done is the, how do you make it, you know, citizen driven. Currently when you want to create a health record of an individual, it's, the common belief is that it's controlled by the insurance companies and the hospitals that, where you go to. But what's this, you know, how do you make it completely uh, a citizen controlled and citizen centric health record. So we came up with this idea of universal health interface, or UHI, which is like a Google Doc or your own Gmail, etc., which is in your control, obviously, and you know what's happening to that record. So that's an important piece in the movement towards uh, building health ecosystem, which engulfs not only the public sector health uh, uh, services, but also the private sector, the academia, everybody, they follow the same standard of UHI. So we have created already in a population of 1.3 billion in India, 250 million are already, you know, they have the, uh, you know, uh, common health ID uh, in the country. And 17 million in the last month or so, 17 million person controlled or patient controlled health records have been created. So it's happening in a big way in India. Then. Another point which has been alluded to earlier by, by Marcos and Joris is the, which solution do you trust? You know, in healthcare, trust is very important, you know, to, to go by a solution. So how do you trust a solution? So a very nice concept of a sandbox has been created uh, two years ago, 2020, as part of this initiative, health initiative, which I was chairing. So uh, the, all the solutions, you know, so solution providers were, and innovators were asked to register with that platform, sandbox platform, and over 400 plus solutions were registered and 100 plus have been validated. Validated in the sense that it does what it proposes to do as a solution to the patient. It doesn't do any harm to the patient. It complies with the data regulations of the country and it's technologically sound and is affordable. So, it, when it goes through the middle of the sandbox, all these are put behind a, a stamp of uh, approval is given to those. So 100 plus solutions uh, have been certified on sandbox. A very important milestone, uh, you know, or a, a building block uh, in the whole ecosystem development. Last but not least in the health ecosystem approach is the security by design and privacy by design. Because again, it has, goes back to the trust element. In health, I, I don't want to trust even my nearest family member of my health record, with my health record. So that being the case, these two become very, very critical in uh, building ecosystems. How do you see that security and privacy are not retrofit into a health ecosystem, but by design from day one, each line of code, you know, smacks of uh, security and privacy. So these were the, you know, at the macro level, at the health ecosystem level that we have done. One word about the first cancer care, which you have mentioned, uh, Kelly, uh, is uh, that we found that, you know, the incidence of cancer is really not, not, may not be in terms of numbers, it may not be very large in terms of, but in terms of the burden of disease, it is one of the top three reasons for, you know, uh, burden of disease in the country. Because the duration of cancer is so long, some, sometimes exp uh, you know, spanning over 10 to 20 years even in a patient's lifetime. So that has become a priority and we created a framework called First Cancer Care, 
both these reports, the National Digital Health Blueprint and the first cancer care framework that we created are available uh, on the web and also I requested that you know it can be shared with all of you. So the, it's based on three key things in cancer. One is how do you prevent or detect the cancer at an early stage versus stage three or stage four. And this, if you detect it early, the survival rate is that much more. So there are three components, awareness and screening using artificial intelligence and other point of service devices which are affordable and be taken to the rural areas and you know, uh, early detection happens there. Mass population level screening, I mean. The second component is about building capacities among the doctors using also advanced technologies like AR, VR. Uh, we have seen the presentations of so many companies in these spaces and then also made specific recommendations on how to use AR, VR, etc. in the uh, you know, in training of not only doctors but also people at the primary level, at the village level. And third and last one, again I go back to the data which has been alluded to, we created the concept of oncology data model, ODM, which is an, a global standard but customized to the needs of an oncology patient on an end-to-end -end basis. So these three components are currently and we are focusing on five types of cancer which are incident in the pilot area. Um, namely breast cancer, cervical, lung cancer, oral cancer, and esophageal cancer. So that we don't spread it too thin across all types of cancers, but focus on the major ones. And this is getting uh, uh, implemented in the state of Meghalaya in India, which has the largest incidence of cancer uh, in India, as I already told. And hopefully this model is built, you know, uh, it has inbuilt features for scaling. So that, you know, like, it doesn't become the, uh, the kind of uh, example that Marcos gave, it doesn't become a joke. It is scalable by design, and impact by design is, uh, is built into this uh, pilot. So we're hoping that this will make a difference to the instance of cancer in India and uh, make a ground level impact in three to five years time in reducing cancer. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Edith, I will ask you the final question before we move to audience Q&A. But knowing that Israel has a ad very advanced biotechnology system and other advanced systems, what are some key takeaways, either successes, barriers, challenges that you've heard from the other panelists that resonated with you and some of the ways that uh, Israel navigated them? Um, OK, I just want to refer for the last thing that you said regarding early detection and breast cancer, so I'm wearing this pink ribbon. This is October, the Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so please go check yourselves. Having said that, I'll go back to your question, thank you. Um, well, when trying to uh, apply uh, our platform uh, to enable this um, important for me, um, um, initiative, I think all what you said is exactly following almost step by step all the challenges that we had. Um, first, maybe we go to the regulatory issues and the technology uh, re regulations uh, policies that uh, are on, on the table. So yes, technology is moving mu much more faster, but we are trying to keep pace and we are changing, I can say in Israel that we are, I think in somewhat success, managed to, to follow up not that bad uh, with the regulations and we are a finger on, 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 on the heart and trying to do exactly what we are foreseeing. Well, we're not, uh, we cannot tell the future, but this is something that we are really onto it. Um, and the other thing that you said, Marcus, you said uh, uh, you had to set your goals. And I think that w what I heard is that you want to do so many things and it's good, but, and, and you need to set the, buy, the, the bar very high and then you'll have all the choices. But still you need to, to, to make fragments and step by step and decide which, which priority you have because you don't have the money for everything. And this is something that we also did 
uh, we started small and we then uh, um, enlarge ourselves. So um, being a decentralized uh, biobank means that you can say, okay, one hospital will do more of that because the uh, population there is more relevant for some projects and the other biobank and uh, the other hospital may use, we may collect samples that may um, benefit different projects. Actually, we are trying to um, give samples, to sell samples, <laughs> for uh, everyone that wants to, to, to do whatever they want. We are trying to um, give them samples that we already have and we already uh, um, um, have in our uh, uh, freezers, but also if they want to do something that we don't have yet, we're trying to do prospective collections in order to, to meet their needs. So we are very, um, we listen to the needs of whoever researches, uh, uh, whatever the researchers need, and we try to, to comply. Um, regarding data and uh, security and all that, this stuff, it's a, a huge field to discuss, and I, I don't think I will be able to do this in a few minutes, but I will say that we have a few things. First of all, we are dealing with samples that are not anonymized, but also not identified. It's coded de-identified. So if a researcher gets a sample from the biobank, he knows its number, but he doesn't know that it, is, it belongs to a specific name. But if he wants to, mo to know more information about this patient, we can go back to the hospital and say, okay, what did this patient receive after collecting the sample? What were the outcomes? I'm talking about cancer mostly because this is easier to, to explain. Um, so we can go back. So it's de-identified, it's a huge data lake and you can do AI with it, but you, can go, but you can also go back specifically to get specific information because as you said, people with cancer may live long lives and you want to know what happened later. So this is one thing that is important. And the other thing regarding the data that is being collected, this is a huge challenge because every hospital, I guess, at your countries as well, collect, or the doctors, the nurses, whoever, collects the data according to um, the software that this hospital has. And then you have data, you have, you know, uh, the, uh, diagnostic and maybe uh, uh, treatments and uh, medications and uh, comorbidities and that you can share, but still you, you collect, every hospital collect it a bit differently, and every doctor write it a bit differently. And when you don't have specific fields that you need to fill, and you write it, you know, free text, it's even harder. Um, so we are dealing with different data from different hospitals, different data within the same hospital, and we also have the Hebrew thing that you write from right to left and not from left to right, so you have text which is combined left to right, right to left, and then figure out how to, to manage that data-wise data or software-wise or, you know, computational-wise. So um, this is a great challenge. But I want to say something that I think is the most important thing. I, 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 re um, I recognize a lot of core values that we share, that we want to do better health, uh, health care, and we want to, to collaborate within, uh, nationally, with, outside, internationally, and we want to use the best technologies with uh, the capabilities that we all have within, and I think this is great, but I think everything it comes, comes back to goodwill, and as long as each stakeholder will really say, okay, I have a good will and I will do whatever it needs to do all these three things, using technologies for better healthcare with collaboration with everyone, I think we would be there. 
sooner than later. This is my belief. Thank you so much, and thank you for all of the remarks of the panel. I'd like to now open it up to the audience for one or two very brief questions. Please uh, raise your hand. I'll call on you and introduce yourself and ask the panel. I'll start with you. Do we have a microphone? Thank you so much. I have a question for Dr. Cohen. My name is Miliana Tanic and I come from the Institute of Oncology and Radiology of Serbia, which is the National Cancer Research Center. We are currently in the process of establishing a biobank. And I have a question that is um, most for Israel, but also internationally. In terms of legislature, the ownership of the sample, who does it belong to? Because in many countries it is simply ignored. Obviously the patient has the right to its genetic material, but we have to balance it with, with the research needs. So okay, thank that's, you. That's a great question because I wanted to say something about that and I forgot, so thank you. <laughs> um, well, we think that the uh, samples and the information belongs to the patient as a biobank. I know that uh, hospitals believe that the data is theirs and I know that the government think that the data is theirs to sell and we won't go through that. This is why I said goodwill, because I think eventually this is the thing. Um, uh, we at the Biobank decided at the very beginning, it is part of our policies, that we do not ask for IP. That means that if you as a researcher, either industry, a company, or uh, an academia, your invention is yours. You're using the samples from Midgam, from the biobank, but you own the, the patent, you own the innovation, you own whatever you invented, it's yours. We ask you to say that the source of the biosamples, the source of the data was with us, but we don't, we don't uh, rip you and we don't take your, uh, your IP, it's yours. Um, it, it's not correct for everyone. I mean, this is the National Biobank, but if you will take samples from a specific hospitals, a specific hospital, they may ask you for IP. <laughs> this is something else. Um, but the ownership, we, we call ourselves custod custodians. We are not, we don't own the samples. We just keep them for future use, for develop biomarkers, find uh, uh, um, new pathways, uh, um, I don't know, early detection, whatever you need to do, this is yours. Another question. Here. Hello, uh, my name is Ozren Tosic from Beam3 Australia, uh, the uh, technology assisted, the clinical decision making company. Uh, I would like to touch upon what, but I don't want to answer from you because you already answered part of this question. I would like to ask other uh, uh, members of, of this panel regarding quality of data, because we are, we are, we are all talking about quality, uh, we are all talking about data, but data as we know, especially in healthcare, they are subject to being incomplete, non-specific, uh, or plainly missing, right? So, all being wrong. So, uh, what is the, what, how do you uh, deal with that challenge? Because we all know that the quality of data is crucial in what we get on the other end, whatever you apply, whether you apply human mind or artificial intelligence, computer science, because collection of data is really a big part of collection of data is in hands of humans, and that's prone to errors. Is there any panelists like in particular to. that would like to? start with this, what we do in Serbia, first of all, nice to see you here. Um, uh, generally what we are trying to do, and I, I know Joris was mentioning um, electronic health records and things that are being done in Rwanda. In, in Serbia we do have electronic health records, but as Osra mentioned, uh, with the different quality of data coming from different um, hospitals or primary health care institutions. But I think generally it's seen that if you start using data for different purposes, the quality of data will become better. 
So it's a vicious circle. You know, you don't use them because they're not good quality. They're not good quality because nobody's using them. So it, so um, the, the thing is, and I think that we all agree here, that we need to start doing some pilots with the data <coughs> and then show examples and make it scalable so that we can reuse it in other fields. I just talked to Ina from Merck about telemedicine. Again, let's start with small things. You know, with the one uh, one um, illness, with the one group of um, of doctors, and then start using the data there and start. So this is the best thing we can do. Of course, we have to work on standardization, and I think a lot of things have been done already in standardization, like PACs, the the scans, the you know the um, other um, data that is not only data but the images as well are now being standardized. And I think uh, in Serbia we also have some very good centralized systems such as. A recept, a prescription that has a really standardized, very excellent uh, data that can be reused. But now the question is, let's reuse this data. I, we understand that there are some issues, of course, in data privacy. But in addition to that, I think um, this is this is something we, where we need to balance uh, um, both the, the quality and the use of data, and then that will make the pressure uh, towards the better quality. I would say. What Yelena said. <laughs> it's a very painful uh, e uh, issue that you raise. Yeah, uh, I have a comment. Uh, this is one of the pillars of the project that we are developing about data governance. Because we soon realized first that the health sector, at least in Brazil, they didn't use so much the data for decision making, for management perspectives. And because they don't use this data, the quality is really poor. And one of the pillars is to make sure that the data has the ideal quality. And to do that, we are developing this framework in order to establish process and people that are responsible for this. Uh, why? In the practical case that we are involved in this municipality in, in Brazil, in the Secretariat of Health of this municipality, we saw that there are some health units, for instance, that use uh, notebooks, uh, paper filling, mm -hmm. some use tablets, and some use Excel spreadsheet, and in the same city, and different kinds of quality of this data. And nobody cares about the quality because they don't use for decision making. So we are developing frameworks for process in order to guarantee that the right data are responsible for the right people, and you have the accountability of this data. And just to give you a, uh, one thing that happened, uh, we were involved in the project, and suddenly we soon realized that there was an epidemic of cholera in Brazil, but in this municipality. But we saw, oh, we don't have cholera in the last century, decades that we don't have here in Brazil. It was because they implemented the information system. And the, the disease code, the first one, I think, was zero or one. <laughs> the doctor said, oh, OK, that, that, let's go to the, <laughs> to the next one. And this, suddenly, we, oh my god. So we have to go after to find out that it was not the colors, because the doctors did that. And nobody was responsible for this data. And because no one was responsible and accountable for this data, nobody cared. So when we develop this process for data governance, we establish responsibilities, accountabilities, and process that you do make it. Uh, so uh, this is one example of what we're going through. Um, we have to deal with this. So before we start to use, not even AI, before we use big data or any kind of software to use the data, first you have to trust the data. And you have to make people responsible and accountable for that. Otherwise, nobody uses this. Because we have to remember that the AI and the system, they are the engine of the things. The few is the data. If you have a bad few, you break all the car or the equipment that we are using. So that's why data is so important, because it's the fuel of AI. And if you don't have the quality, don't have the security, don't have the privacy, don't have the regulatory framework for that, the engine will, broke, will break. Just one 30-second value add to that is uh, the quality, even 
important dimension of health data is also interoperability of the data. So adopting the standards and making all the health institutions adopt that is a very important dimension in the we have HL7 slash Fire Force standard currently, but how do you make it work at the field level and and doesn't it doesn't in such a manner that it doesn't add to the burden of the doctor already uh, rather than looking at the patient, the doctor is busy keying in the data. So we have solutions today, fortunately, which as the physician is talking, the, the system is absorbing that, converting it to the HL7 format automatically without any additional effort. So such solutions are required. So to, to make, not only to ensure the quality, but also to make it interoperable. Just one comment about that. Uh, in the model that we are developing, there are four maturity level for using this data in the, not only in the health, but any sector. The first one is to be legal. So do they accomplish with the data privacy law? It's the first step. The second step is, can I trust to use this data for decision making internally in the organization? It's the second level. The third level is the interoperability. Okay, I'm, my house is clean, is organized, so I can share this data with others. I don't know if the other house is clean and organized, but <laughs> you have to deal with this interoperability. And the fourth level is the open data. So we can now open the data because we have all the three parts organized in order to make it happen. Well, thank you, everybody, for today. I think we are uh, getting ready to move on to lunch. But on behalf of the World Economic Forum, I want to very much thank not only our speakers here, but also send congratulations to Serbia for the launch of the center today. And we're really excited about working with you, as well as our global network, to work on some of these challenges through ecosystems, building partnerships, and of course, designing for impact. So uh, please, if you have any questions that you didn't get to ask, feel free to find the panelists during the rest of the the session today and enjoy the rest of the convening. Thanks. Please thank, thank you. Can thank we you. have a picture of the panel, please? Now let's continue and let's talk about biotech from different perspectives. I will first announce my today's guests. Some of them are dear friends. I will start with Natasha Skoko. So at the moment, she's a head of biotechnology development unit at International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. She's uh, graduated from Belgrade University and then moved to Trieste. Uh, worked a lot of, uh, on biotech, on uh, production of biosimilars. And uh, now she's actually coordinating tech transfer of the whole organization. This is organization uh, uh, actually uh, managed by partially United Nations, so 64 countries are present. We will talk today about technology transfer from one center to like 64 countries, so we will have a lot of questions for her today. Uh, my next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Claudia Vickers. Welcome. Thank you for being today with us. She's Chief Scientific Officer at Eden Brew. Well, that's animal-free dairy company. So we will talk about milk without animals today and real biotech. Uh, her research focus uh, is on developing sustainable industrial products using bio-based solutions. So she's in academia, government research, and industry, a mixture. Uh, for past 20 years, so she's in real biotech. And uh, also an expert in synthetic biology in microbes. And Wes, one more important thing, co-chair of the World Economic Forum Synthetic Biology Global Future Council. So everything is in, al in alignment for today. Uh, now I would like to announce Dr. Charles Ruranga, director of African Center of Excellence in Data Science. So we have a data scientist here. Uh, actually, he has a PhD in statistics, econometrics, 
and he's director of the African Center of Excellence in Data Science with over 19 years of experience both in academia research, grants, development and management and consultancy. And now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Martin Mösler. So he comes from um, innovation part. He's a managing director of Science Park Graz, Austria. So that's one of the one of the or the oldest uh, and largest high tech incubator, if I'm right. And he's a passionate about innovations and entrepreneurship. So uh, he and his team are supporting uh, numerous uh, companies, including hopefully biotech companies, and we will discuss about the challenges of biotech companies in the ecosystem. He's also uh, the ambassador in EU Space Agency's Business Incubation Center for Austria and uh, Southeast Europe. And every year they support more than 50 startup companies within their environment. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Kieran Naido. So he's at the moment. <laughs> investor and uh, CEO of Zdravlje. So that's our very old and still very successful pharmaceutical company that was acquired by Frontier based on London. Uh, he's actually investment banker, formerly a top-ranked investment banker in Merrill Lynch Investment Bank, but nevertheless he's now uh, focused on biopharmaceuticals and uh, he's, let's say, introducing biotech and biotech R&D in Serbia from a perspective of one uh, biopharma company. So thank you very much for all of you to be here today with us. And I will now ask for the presentation because uh, a lot of you, I guess, are not from biotech. And we started today's, you know, sessions, all the sessions, biotech, biotech, biotech. But if you're not in science, well, I would like to explain what is biotech. Actually, and I had to stand up. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so I guess this reminds you, you know, in the first class biology 101 when some of you escaped those classes, you know, and they were running away from the biology when we were kids. But nevertheless, today is becoming really, really important. What is biotech? I mean, we use our knowledge and our skills actually to change the nature and actually to make a better world for us humans. So what is biotechnology? We use biological systems that can be an organism, an animal, plant, microorganism, bacteria, or part of the organism, like a cell from an animal, cell from plant, and we are using them to make products. So this is the basis of biotechnology. Uh, the root of biotech itself, it's biology, but now it's becoming really multidisciplinary, as you will see. But since we stopped being hunters and gatherers, I mean, we got involved in biotech. It's traditional biotech, but nevertheless, it's biotech. We were trying to select better crops, better animals. We were producing cheese, not intentionally putting bacteria in there, but the fermentation happened. So we had cheese, we had wine, we had beer. So as long as we are here on the planet, from that momentum, biotech started. Nevertheless, the technology changed. And then we entered the 20th century. So we discovered DNA. Then we, start, uh, we started to play with DNA. We learned how to cut DNA. So cut and paste DNA. And this is our genetical information. Then the genetic engineering started. Recombinant DNA technology. Now you heard about GN, uh, G, gene editing. So we are becoming more and more precise in changing <coughs> the very information of life. We can read genetic information that's called DNA sequencing. 
This is the reading of genetical information. In 20th century, we could synthesize, let's say, shorter parts of the DNA, but we can produce, chemically produce DNA. So we didn't need a living organism for it. And then biotechnology gathers genetics, biochemistry, molecular biology, chemical engineering, and it's been applied in medicine, agriculture, pharmaceutical industry, food industry, environment protection. And then we come to the 21st century. Okay, these are just some of the, you know, examples. We produce human growth hormone in a rabbit. We produce human insulin in bacteria. And then 21st century. So we learn how to massively read and very fast and very cheap DNA. But we learn also how to synthesize long stretches of DNA. That means we can produce, and you heard from Professor Church, we can produce artificial chromosomes. So chemically synthesized chromosomes, we can put them in an organism. And that organism can divide, I will show you. So we develop bioinformatics and at the end, there is an AI. So everything is being combined at this moment. Some call it convergence, some call it fifth industrial revolution. I don't know what is it, but it's a huge change. Human genome, project was completed. We produce vaccines in yeast, for instance. We use microorganisms to clean our environment. We use genetical engineering to produce rice with vitamin A, because we need it in the areas where vitamin A is in deficiency. And then we made artificial chromosome, put it in bacteria, and this bacteria is dividing. Now we have AI that is creating artificial chromosomes. They're not still dividing, but it's a matter of time. Some of the biotech projects and products that are already on the market. So this is a very, becoming very popular artificial meat for, oh, hmm. just. Ah, okay, wow. This is something new for me. <laughs> so, impossible foods. So this is a vegetarian hamburger, but it required, you know, that nice red, I mean, we always want it to be perfect, nice reddish meat, so it looks like the real meat. So they produced in yeast uh, something that is similar to our hemoglobin, to animal hemoglobin. And now it looks really nice. We're producing different materials that we can use on our cell phones, on our laptops, in bacteria. We're producing and making bacteria to act like they never acted in nature, so they can combine, for instance, with corn and give nitrogen to the corn. We are making huge progress in biomedicine because we can take cell from human, reprogram it, and put it back and make it fight the cancer on the long term. We're producing food with concentrations of some compounds that we need and we can play with it. This is all affecting our everyday life. And now, I mean, it's becoming really a predominant field. It leads us towards bioeconomy. It's not something that replaces everything we had so far, but it's a complement. And this is a real revolution. This is a real level revolution. So what we are talking about, I mean, biotechnology is here. It's always been here, but the technology is developing. It's shaping our presence. But what will happen in future? I think there are a lot of questions that are arising. You heard some of them. But I will now try to discuss with, with my colleagues to see from different perspectives some challenges and uh, some overview what is happening and what they're working on. So thank you for this. Now I don't need it. <clears throat> okay, I will start with, with question. 
uh, with uh, Natasha. Let's try to be concise because I have a lot of questions and then if we have time I will open some discussion and I guess we will have the questions from, from the auditorium. Uh, I mean, you have been in biotech for 20 years and uh, as a part of ICGB, it's really amazing concept because it's a network of countries working and transferring technologies between themselves. Could you explain just a little bit for the auditorium, what is ICGB and what are you doing? I know that you're working on biosimilars and on tech transfer to other countries. What is the concept? It's beautiful. So. Okay. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for, to Yelena for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come home. From every, everything started here, as Yelena said, I was a student at the University of uh, Belgrade, and also I was a young scientist at the Institute for Genetic Engineer, Molecular Genetic and Genetic Engineering here in Belgrade. So it's my great pleasure to share our story, our successful story. So as you heard, I belong to the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, and just very quickly, we were open 35 years ago as an idea. An idea was that this biotechnology, genetic engineering, starting as Yelena mentioned, is not just for rich. So the idea was how to share this knowledge and how to give, provide this knowledge to everyone. So we make a very nice UNIDO uh, special project, so United Nations Industrial Development Organization special project, and we were conceived as, uh, uh, as you heard now, now we have in 66 member state countries all around the world. They're all low and middle income countries, developing countries. Now we have also already developed, well-developed countries as our members. So for what we were doing? like excellence in research, science, in molecular biology and biotechnology, and to provide this to the industry. So to build also the bridge, how this knowledge should be shared with the industry. So this is basically what my group do. I'm, I'm heading the Biotechnology Development Unit at this institution there in Italy. And what we do, we develop, we said, okay, there is a need for this knowledge. Let's develop it in these 30 years in-house, and then let's offer it as a training, as a technology transfer, as a in-house, hands-on training uh, to the developing world, to the uh, personnel from the uh, local companies. Why? Because we think that the biopharmaceuticals, biological drugs should be available to everyone. They are unfortunately not affordable to, to everyone because they are still very expensive. But after 20 years with the patent expired, then everyone can use that knowledge and can produce it as generic. Generic of biological drug is, is called biosimilar. So this is what we successfully do for more than 25 years. We transfer these technologies knowledge, we shape their local um, um, uh, companies, we try to help them build local industries and then uh, being completely independent and uh, not relying on the imports. Just to add three seconds that now more than ever in pandemic, we saw how that was important. I mean, if you just look, we work a lot of with African countries as well, 97% like of all the imports of drugs and biological and pharma, um, any drug coming from import. So during COVID, like 94 countries just stop export of these drugs. So then, then country realize, oh my God, like local uh, uh, production is really important. So this is, the idea in ICGB started 35 years ago, and we really successfully did it all, all, all these years. Thank you very much. I, I mean, I've been following it uh, for past 20 years, and really a lot of success stories. And uh, we will discuss later about, you know, uh, is it only for the rich countries, or can we do something for the rest of the world, which is like 90% of the world? Uh, Dr. Vickers, I will start with, a, I had the first question, but I would like to, to, to spice it a little bit. Uh, can we have milk without cows? Could you explain about the concept of your company and what are you doing at the moment? Because this is going to, I think, interest everyone. Yeah, sure. Um, so I work for a company called Eden Brew. I'm the chief scientific officer there. I've only recently transitioned into the, uh, the startup company world. So I guess I'm an example of someone who's spent 
25 plus years in um, academia and government research and decided to see what it's like inside the startup world. And the reason I did that is because I have spent um, a great deal of that time in the last decade or so uh, helping to establish synthetic biology and advanced bioengineering as a recognisable field in Australia, um, which is another story that I can tell you about. Uh, but after all of this time and effort and work put into it, I realised that we still, as a nation, were not doing the translation of the science very well. And I, I came out of a five-year period with our federal research organisation, the CSIRO, um, out from a program that had a remit to, to do two things, one of which was establish a framework for industrial translation of science. And we did a lot in that, but there was still a lot more to do. And I realised that I, I didn't really know well enough what industry needed to get that happening effectively. And I thought that my ability to develop those frameworks will really improve significantly if I spend a bit of time in industry and have more of a, a hard-nosed understanding of what happens in industry. So that's why I moved to, to Eden Brew. Um, and our company, we make, yeah, we make milk without the cows. And there's a really good reason for that. It's a, a sustainability driver. So when I moved to industry, I wanted to be sure that what I was doing was going to make a difference at scale. And milk is a very important um, nutritional component of diets all over the world. Uh, it's not, a, not very sustainably produced, so it produces a lot of carbon emissions, um, especially the methane produced by, by cattle. Uh, it uses a lot of water, it uses a lot of land. So the approach that we use is to take the genes from cows and put them into yeast, and then we brew the yeast up, just like making um, beer or wine, and then we harvest the proteins, the, the dairy proteins, the caseins and the, the whey proteins from the solution that the, the yeast are growing in, and then we use those proteins to recreate milk. So yes, we can have milk without the cow. Amazing. I mean, amazing. I didn't yeah. know that. I recently heard about that. Yeah, th this is a huge area as alternative proteins, mm -hmm. and the leg hemoglobin that you talked about from Impossible Foods is, is one example of that. Um, and I think, you know, our ability to produce this, so that the, this kind of technology, we can deliver a product that has one third of the carbon emissions, uses 95% less of the land, and uses 1% of the water, which is really important. So water is a critical resource. There will be, there already are wars being fought over access to water. There will be more wars fought over access to, wa to water in the future. So if we can produce proteins in a much more sustainable, environmentally friendly way, um, much more intensive. We can also um, do it locally and distribute it. Um, and it, it's an important component of um, national food security as well, particularly in areas that don't have good arable land. Then we can really make a difference in the, the real world at scale. And I mean, our company has only been around for 18 months where we're doing a Series A raise at the moment. Um, and we've already sort of been able to get to the point of making demonstration milk products, recreated milk products, and we're about to substitute any recombinant proteins to make that product. So the technology can move very quickly. I'm sure that this is going to be a success. I mean, this is the future, definitely. I agree. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Charles, so uh, you're in data science. So how would you describe the center is impacting on the society in brief? And um, I know that you're involved also in AI. So uh, where did the AI found the application? Are you connected it with, connecting it with the biotech at the moment? So some kind of overview what is happening because we don't know what is happening in your country. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for giving me this opportunity and many thanks to the organizing of this conference of inviting me to give the brief of what we are doing in the African Center of Excellence in Data Science. Yeah, the African Center in Data Science is based at the University of Rwanda. Uh, that is in Rwanda. Uh, for those who don't know, Rwanda is a, in Eastern, East Africa country in Africa. So that is where we have the Republic of Rwanda. And the uh, University of Rwanda is a public institution. Uh, the Center of African Center of Excellence Data Science started in 2016. Uh, is still young with the, the support of the government and the World Bank. 
yeah, the main motivation of starting the center was to fill the gap mainly in the area of data science. So the center started and now we, we have a different orientations or specializations. Uh, the main activity are postgraduate training, conduct a collaborative research, uh, but uh, not be limited like uh, what we are doing in the normal academic institutions. We have started uh, what we call the incubation hub uh, and with the, the, the fund from the government and the World Bank, uh, there was a motivation to work with partners. Uh, not only academia or public institution, we need to be working with private and other industries. So with the data drive and incubation hub, uh, we'll have the place where students, others who are working outside uh, can meet with uh, innovative ideas and those ideas they can get kind of mentorship and respond to the needs of the, the society. Uh, currently we after that, uh, we started starting, we, we have a master's student. Uh, the, it was a regional center. We, it is based at the University of Rwanda in Rwanda, but we have students from different countries in Africa who came for master's and PhD, and also came for as faculty or who can come for the pro short courses. Uh, we, we have uh, different areas. So one of those areas we started, yeah, they need to be data scientists first, so they can apply it in biostatistics or health. Others can go in actuarial science, economics. Uh, we have others who remain in data mining. Uh, so those are the different specializations we, we have. As a unit in public institution and the university, uh, the impact will be on different sites. One is the, the student who will be doing masters and the PhD will be able to do the graduation and they will respond to the, the gap. Uh, the, the gap was identified before, not only in Rwanda but also in the region. So masters students have already graduated and uh, up to now, two PhD candidates also graduated. They are working in different institutions, uh, either in Rwanda or in their home countries. Uh, the second part where we, we need really, we are putting more effort is that incubation hub. The process is, uh, if it is in health or any other sector, we have the, the call we can get students with those innovative ideas uh, can be uh, related to the problem identified in the specific company or institution and they will come get those men mentorship and after they will propose it can be application it can be any other solution based on the problem so uh, that is where we, we are now okay and what I can, that is what I can say now in brief on the African Center. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, Martin, you are supporting the startup community. How challenging, I don't, first, how many of those, let's say, 50 companies per year are in real biotech? And how challenging is to support biotech company, for instance, I always compare it with the IT and I always put, you know, 10 times everything, risk, money. So how challenging from your perspective is biotech? Thank you. Great question, Jelena. I, uh, I also thank you, by the way, for the uh, organization of uh, Professor Church's uh, this, uh, presentation, which was incredibly intriguing and, uh, and thought-provoking. And I mean, I couldn't think of a better opportunity to have a panel um, than after such a, uh, such a great presentation. Um, developing biotech companies has become a lot easier during the last two years um, because of, uh, you know, uh, the, we, it's, it's always about timing. 
Um, I was also thinking of you know meat uh, meat substitute, milk substitutes. I mean, don't get me wrong. This is great technology. It it basically was the timing making this business an option uh, in the way uh, we we can proceed today. Huh? Uh, meat substitutes uh, are actually different. I mean, the the, the, the milk, the, the dairy substitute is a bit more complex, but the meat substitute, I mean, it's nothing, not, from a scientific level, not interesting at all. Huh? Um, <laughs> it's it's basically you know. No, don't get me wrong, the example was good, but still it's the timing of people yeah. being aware that uh, carbon emissions are very much, 17% of all our carbon emissions are, are, are related to agriculture, uh, large parts of that uh, to, 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 to cattle in particular, but also of course pigs, etc. So um, it's about timing. It, it's become much easier, I'm talking about timing, it's become much easier during the last two years because of the common awareness of, uh, of health uh, being, uh, being critical because of uh, you know, this really trickling down throughout the whole society and uh, throughout the world. And also because of, the, um, because of certain uh, basically technologies being critically important in order to, uh, found, to find countermeasures, which were important for two reasons. First of all, um, due to the for, for physical reasons, but also for psychodynamic reasons, because having something in place which kind of is able to combat the invisible um, uh, was at least as important as the protective uh, element of uh, vaccines uh, helping our bodies to, to cope with, uh, with certain challenges. So it's become much easier, I'm repeating myself, um, it's become a primary uh, source of, in, uh, primary target of investment uh, f for investors, mm -hmm. which is almost a bit annoying when you're a catch-all uh, technology developer as I am, with, uh, with uh, quite a large array of, uh, of incredibly smart entrepreneurs um, and uh, everybody is wanting to, <laughs> to invest into biotech. Um, and one last thing which is also important, I think the beauty of biotech is that it is, a, it is all about generalism. While we come from a spe specialist driven world where the scientist does not respect the technology individual, you know, have you ever talked to a like heavy weight, fully bred scientist, what he or she, she thinks about an engineer? I mean, you know, this is like the proletariat. This is the guys you don't really talk to. This is the guys who fix your washing machine. And have you ever talked to, a, to an engineer what he thinks about the business guys? Because it's <laughs> these three factors which are critical. It's the science and it's really the deep, deep, deep blue sky research which we need. Um, it's where, where, and then it, you need, uh, you need the, the, the proper heavy, heavyweight technicians who actually make it feasible, you know, he, who make it operable. And in order to really bring it into the market, and this is why Mr. Church was so impressive, you need someone who has the business understanding, and the first two mostly don't have it. it yeah. t sometimes there is geniuses who are and I'll come to, I'll, I'll have one example, but mostly the scientist is really not good at applying um, and the, uh, the, the person who applies stuff is actually always looking for the beauty of the solution, you know. F producing the perfect car, we are now off topic, but producing the perfect car is probably not make the, uh, is probably gonna move the uh, car producer out of business. So. Um, the great solutions are, they may be important when it comes to, and this is the good thing here, we need to be, when it comes to health, when it comes to biotech, we need to be perfect. Everybody needs to be perfect. Blue sky uh, research needs, needs to be perfect. Application, because if we have nothing, we need to be aware, we have nothing to apply if we don't have blue sky research. The, the, the basic science is what people apply, and it's the technology which, uh, which helps the guys who apply stuff, and it is the um, it is the business spirit and the knowledge of the market and what goes and what doesn't and what is right in terms of timing, which then drives out products we all can talk about. Thank you. So many things to think about. I mean, good point. Kieran, you come from the investor yes. part side. Uh, you also come from the industry mm -hmm. involved in biopharma definitely mm -hmm. production of biologics yeah. and different products 
So I would like to know about the R&D. Yeah. What, what model of R&D, for instance, are you employing within your company or companies, yeah. because there are a lot of companies, are you subcontracting, are you collaborating with academia, or you have internal complete R&D like some multinationals yeah. usually yeah. have yeah. so far? Yeah. So thank you firstly for inviting me to this very interesting panel discussion. And it's very nice to meet all of you and, and discuss these, uh, these exciting concepts with you. Um, so we are biopharmaceutical investors. Uh, we're based in London. Um, and uh, originally, I would say, uh, our claim to fame was uh, being responsible uh, for uh, producing the first biosimilar product that was launched in, in Europe and Canada, a product called Infliximab in partnership with Saltrion, which is a, a big South Korean uh, biopharmaceutical uh, company uh, who we continue to have a relationship with uh, since even after we invested here in Serbia. Um, regarding our activities here in Serbia, we invested in, as Jelena mentioned, uh, quite a well-established 70-year-old manufacturer uh, that's quite well known. And today, we, we export to about uh, 40 countries around the world, so as far as Australia, South Africa, Mexico, UK, EU. Um, and we have restarted R&D activities. It's not strictly in, in biopharmaceuticals, but I'll get to that in a second. But uh, we are now uh, developing um, the first patent-protected product uh, in Serbia that's under license from Pfizer. So we have an authorized version of Paxlovid, which is the nirmatrelvir ritonavir combination product, um, which is quite new and innovative. It is pandemic dependent. It's a, a quite a strong uh, uh, antiviral, so it really depends on the outcome of the, of the pandemic. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is we started or restarted um, R&D of that nature here in Serbia. Um, I think it's a good example. Uh, to your question around academia, uh, we have included, for example, the Faculty of Pharmacy and uh, here in Belgrade, and it has really been uh, quite a, a valuable contribution to this project. Um, I would say there are a few factors. Number one is uh, understanding capabilities. I would say there is uh, pent up uh, demand on the academic side to, uh, to be involved in applied projects where they can see uh, really what the, um, the outcome will be. In this case, when we started the project, it was creating um, a novel therapy for, for COVID-19. Um, but we're big fans of collaboration. Uh, to answer your point, we, uh, we have multiple partnerships where we are uh, looking to tech transfer products uh, into Serbia, for example. Uh, Natasha, very similar to, to what you, you, you're involved with, um, where our partners have spent the time, the energy, the money on developing uh, novel technologies, and we're looking to tech transfer. So we don't take a bet so much on the technology, but rather on developing the capabilities. And for that, I think if you want to, this is, I'm from South Africa, there's an African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. So for us, it's really important um, to collaborate uh, with the universities, uh, with, uh, for example, WHO uh, partnered entities. For example, we're sending uh, a, a, a PhD to South Korea. Marina is here, she's going to be going to South Korea, hopefully coming back. Um, we to, hope so too. To study GMP, to study GMP and GLP uh, activities and 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 and, and skills uh, in biotechnology. Uh, but certainly, we don't intend to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so we would like to have a biologic manufacturing platform here. That in itself is innovative enough for us. So we're starting small. We would like to offer. Uh, capabilities in upstream, downstream, and fill and finish, um, and then start to provide a platform um, for other, either multinationals or biotech uh, to shift some of their activities here. Um, and, and it could be just part of the value chain, not the entire value chain. So we don't take a bet on IP, but this is our way of entering in a controlled way. Uh, because as you know, with biotechnology, it's highly regulated. Um, so, you know, we rather just focus on the production aspects rather than the regulatory or the commercial aspects of, of biotechnology. Thank you. Now, because we, we are running out of time, I will pose a question. Whoever wants to reply to it, just, you know, raise your hands. Uh, so, um, I mean, research in biotech is rather 
expensive. The development of the product, it's not cheap. So is biotechnology reserved only for rich countries? And can it be the cause of inequality in the society? Because, you know, the products are expensive, particularly if we talk about a biomed. So whoever wants to start, let's be short and give chance to everyone. Martin wants to start, okay. I think this question is similar to the topic of the digital divide, actually. Um, we had this debate about 20 years ago, what digitalization would lead to, whether it would uh, leave the rather not so well of countries uh, completely aside. And um, we are, we've been witnessing, and this was, the answer was not clear. Huh? The topic digital, digital divide was a huge scientific debate. How can we make sure that uh, this form of literacy is uh, trickling down into, into the, the the southern hemisphere and to into the not so privileged regions, and it actually worked out rather well. It um, uh, the, the 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 whole catch up uh, dynamism was was highly underestimated. So I think this might be similar here, right. and I think we also have an obligation to 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 secure, um, especially when it comes to path breaking uh, path breaking technologies, to really secure the uh, large uh, available, uh, mm -hmm. availability of, uh, of, of our solutions. And you know, if, if something can fix, uh, let's, let's, uh, if, if we find a bacteria which can really um, bind uh, carbon, dioxide, carbon dioxide, for example, at uh, huge quantities uh, at a very low energy, because basically mostly you require energy to push the carbon back into in, in, in its original form. Um, I, I think it would be rather stupid not to, uh, not to make it available to larger markets. Okay. On the other hand, of course, um, this could be different to digitalization as well. Yeah, we'll see. Natasha, yeah, I yeah. see. <laughs> I think we are probably in a good position to, to answer this question yeah. because th this is actually what we are actively doing last 20, 25 years. And I, and I have to say that the key is uh, knowledge sharing. So this is what we really tried. And also, okay, the other key word is a technology transfer, because yes, we all agree that technology and science is moved by uh, blue sky science, but also it's true that you have first to give people like the, the, the basic knowledge, the basic tools to be able to develop. So, and I have to say that this idea that we like, uh, uh, grow this. Uh, this idea is growing like in our institution for 25 years. We finally uh, really found a good collaboration with World Health Organization and we are happy that World Health Organization actually recognized that need uh, when they published the call last year, in December last year, for the central hub for training of bioprocess, bioprocessing training hub. So that means, okay, we saw it during the COVID, we have technology, but actually if we want to transfer their no people to be trained. So yeah, then we true. found ourselves, okay, great, we want the science, we want to, uh, you know, uh, transfer all this knowledge, but to whom? So we are now really at the ICGB, and actually I'm really happy to say that in December my group will train first people from this hub to, to uh, two, two weeks training to tell, you know, how all the production for biological drugs, and I just wanted to say what is biological drug, like uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Elena mentioned, but for example, insulin. You know, everyone heard about insulin, there is also diabetes pandemic today, and, and, and for sure the doses of insulin that are produced today are not sufficient. So, so this is basically train people to, to understand what is the production process, how to do it, starting from genetically engineered cells, doing through the production, purification, quality control, arrive to the product, oh my god, I can do it. And you can show them this in two weeks, and then they will come up with their own ideas. And then we are talking about the blue sky science, and this is what we really so with our successful story because we trained like a scientist from the big pharma companies in Bangladesh and you know now they are after 10 years, uh, they, they are actually start to thinking on their own way, start to thinking, oh my God, there's some new molecules, maybe we can do some something, you know, touching a little bit of that blue sky science. So, so I think really that to answer your question, the most important thing is really sharing knowledge and we at the ICGB came out with this idea like non-exclusive share knowledge through the training. And then, you know, train, uh, uh, technology transfer, training of 
people who will actually be our thinkers. Yeah, I think we, we need uh, more uh, examples uh, like what ICGB is doing if we want to really speed up the process and, uh, you know, put it deeply into the society. Because it's really interesting, when you go to these countries, you know, they always will tell you, yeah, but that's not for us. I mean, I mean, what do you mean it's not for us? It's expensive. Yeah, it is, but okay, let's see how to start. And we heard this morning, Mar uh, Marcos, I think, he mm -hmm. said from Brazil, he said, yeah, uh, you are starting with big ideas and not the small bonsai projects. But we really started 35 years ago with a lot of small bonsai projects that at the end, they grow themselves on a yeah. huge forest. So, so that could be one way of okay. address that question. Thank you, Kieran. Um, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I think it's also a question of scale um, and also um, acceptance of, of technologies that we can find in the East, for example. We have an investment in a, in a South Korean uh, biopharmaceutical company that uh, has developed uh, biosimilar for an insulin product, the top selling insulin product, Lantus from Sanofi, uh, that has a yield of four times. Um, and by, by yield, it's really the, the output, meaning that the price per unit comes down quite significantly. It will take quite a long time for that product to reach the patient. There's you know, clinical trials, uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, and there's a very complex regulatory pathway to go through before that product can reach the, the, the patient, and it doesn't need to be as complicated as that. Um, if we can find a way, I'm thinking now about Serbia very specifically because um, you know the, the, the country relies on, on EU and US products primarily, bi uh, pharmaceuticals, bio or chemical. Um, if there is a way for us to, to, to access and accept uh, products that are developed, high quality products that are developed, for example, in South Korea, Japan, which is really futuristic, then there could be a way for us um, to create healthcare savings, uh, to create tech transfer opportunities here, uh, to produce monoclonal antibodies or, 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 or vaccines. Um, I, I don't see the barrier to entry as that high. Okay, so we have like five minutes. Yes. All right, so, so let's be really quick, but from everything that we, we discussed, although there are a lot of questions, and I guess from the, the, the audience uh, also, uh, how the government can assist in speeding up the development of, let's say, a biotechnological product? Because, you know, the average time is really long, and I guess there, uh, the regulations are maybe one obstacle, the procedures some um, that are imposed by the government, or the lack of some kind of support may be very, you know, uh, not so complicated, but it, if it's there, it will be faster or deeper, I don't know. Just in two sentences, how can the government, or if you have an example of good practices, governmental practices, where should we look for? Oh, can I start? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> I, I think agile regulatory systems are really important. So our Office of the Gene Technology Regulator and the Gene Technology Code is updated every three to five years, I think, okay. which is really very unusual. No other policy is wow. updated every three to five wow. years. Uh, and there is public engagement in that process. So there's an um, invitation out to everybody to contribute to that, and they get a lot of mm -hmm. submissions. Uh, so that so it's probably again one of the only policies that is that is um, public facing, and empowers everybody to be involved in development mm -hmm. of it. So that's quite important. Government understanding that biotechnology is, is a you know it's it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. marathon. It's, it's a long term engagement process. It takes longer than other technologies. You can't just make an app and 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 roll it out. And as a consequence of that, there needs to be policy engagement at fairly high levels. So in Australia. Uh, our Australian Council of Learned Academies works closely with the government to provide advice. Uh, and at one stage I ended up in the, the, um, the Prime Minister's office explaining to him why synthetic biology was important and needed to be invested into by the government, which was then able to kickstart a process of development of uh, research programs within our federal research agency, the CSIRO, um, under their Future Science Platforms program, uh, and then was, then was 
had the opportunity to lead that program for five years to develop a um, collaborative research community across the entire nation and really push development of the technology forward very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So we had more than 300 people involved in that. We, had, we trained about 110 early in mid-career research uh, scientists out of that to be the leaders of the new, you know, the new wave of technology leaders coming out of that. We had, we had 10 um, spin-out companies and most importantly, we had scientists, social scientists, engineers, uh, policy people, all involved in that program. So it was truly interdisciplinary and the development of all of those fields were progressing in parallel towards similar aims. Um, that was very successful. As I said, the technology transfer part of that was the more challenging part. So we did a lot of road mapping, and, and policy roadmaps, as painful as they are and as hackneyed as they are, actually are important to help drive policy. Uh, so we did two. We did, we did the Australian Council of Learned Academies did one that looked into what was on the horizon for Australia and where we might benefit from it. And then CSIRO did one uh, through my program, which I commissioned, um, and it was very much about the economic opportunity for Australia mm -hmm. in the space. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that identified that by 2040, there's a $27 billion economic opportunity with 44,000 jobs to be developed out of synthetic biology, applied primarily in areas of agriculture and health and medicine, um, which is where the, the economic benefit would come from for the nation. And they have to be nation specific, so different nations will have different considerations um, as part mm. of that economic development process. So it takes broad Broad, broad uh, yeah. stakeholders, everyone. Yeah, it's like, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats and everybody has to be involved yeah. in that movement going mm. forward. I, I totally agree. Mm. Dr. Dr. Ranga, any comments on the assistance, how important the assistance of the government, even for the data science center that you are leading? So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, when you come to the government support in this process for the research or any activity applied the research. I think the, yeah, you said on the regulations and the other measures that need to be there. Uh, and the, yeah, when you go to the academia and academic side, the institutions, yeah, they, they need also to have those facilities to do the applied the research and the different product uh, yeah when we are saying the different steps of research in order to have the the product in order to put the product on the market yeah for the the case of rwanda i can share one case because during this period of covid and the the, the vaccination the yeah that is the the government of rwanda take initiative and there is uh, that process to start manufacturing in the pharmacy where we can get the, the vaccination of different medicine inside the Rwanda, not really all the medicine or the to go outside. So that is one of the, the support. The, the government will provide the different support and the, even the companies from outside they will come for investment in Rwanda because we have the different ways in order to get that certificate without taking time and uh, so that is what uh, the government is doing okay. in different areas. So if that is also done in different areas of research, I think this will help to achieve on the side of biotech and the different other initiative can be promoted. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, this is the end of the panel. I could talk for <laughs> hours. I mean, it's just getting interesting. Um, so, uh, I mean, definitely we can conclude that we live in a biotech world and that we are now intervening on everything. We want to make our lives better, more comfortable. Uh, we want to make it greener, cleaner. We want to be healthier. We want to live longer although Professor Church didn't support me, but yes. Uh, but I think it's very important, the, the communication within the whole society, because we, we are tackling uh, very sensitive themes and uh, we're opening uh, very sensitive ethically uh, areas of lives. 
And uh, this is where the, the academia will get, you know, very important place, how to communicate with the public and explain really what biotech is, what are the benefits. We didn't have time to talk about real challenges, but unfortunately we had only one hour. But there are a lot of challenges, ethical challenges and much deeper challenges, use and misuse of everything so far we did as humans. Uh, so we, we need really to include the, the whole society in what will happen even with Bio4, so people are not scared of new technologies, uh, people are aware and really get uh, to know uh, the technology deeply, and I think it's uh, on the scientists on our side to really provide this to the, 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 to the society, among other things also. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Thank you, all the, the guests today. It was really my pleasure. And I hope we will see each other uh, next year on the same conference. Thank you. Thank you.